Christmas came on October 3rd this year, in case you weren't paying attention. October 3rd was like no other day that I've experienced in the pandemic of 2020. It was the day I was finally able to hold my newborn five and a half month old granddaughter, Emrin Renee Ahrens. For the very first time, she was in my arms. It was also the day that I was able to hug my grandsons, Benton Miles and Rylan Antonio, for the first time since February. Now, 168 days had passed since Emron was born, and I need to tell you, when I told my son this, he chuckled at me that I actually knew that. Well, I had been counting. There were 218 days that had passed since I'd held my beloved grandsons, who Susan and I have spent every other Friday with since Benton was just a few months old. Benton now five and a quarter, and Ryland now three and a half. I had seen Emron from a social distance since her birth, but we had not been closer than six feet. As for the boys, we had played on Zoom, we'd played in person. We had hiked together, we'd played games, we'd read books outside together, socially distanced, masked and gloved. We sat down, we shared stories and snacks, but all from a distance. It felt like an eternity, any way you cut it. We were following the CDC directives, and perhaps more importantly, Emron's pediatrician's guidelines and her parents' demands. We were being safe and good, but being safe and good never felt so bad. On Christmas morning, which was October the 3rd, I jumped out of bed, as well as I'm able to jump with my new right hip. I showered, I got dressed, and Susan and I headed north to Solon, Ohio. When we arrived, Rylan and Benton's faces were pressed against the living room window. Their bodies were bouncing for joy. They had welcomed us that same way for months, but this time would be different. Those little faces, which light up my heart every time I see them, would soon be next to my face with masks on. This time, they would be right there. This time, our hands would hold on to each other. This time, we would embrace, and they would sit on my lap and in my arms like they had in the days before COVID-19. As for my beautiful granddaughter, well, I was about to fly over the moon and back. As we came up the driveway, Benton came running out to meet us. I was first up the driveway. He went running toward me, took a hard left, right past me, and right into the arms of my wife. They clearly have a very special relationship, to which I muttered to myself, what am I, chop liver? They are so close, and it's beautiful to behold. Then came the little man, Rylan. He ran into my arms, held me tight, and he said as he looked into my eyes, pop up, never let me go. So I held him like I would never let him go. And then about 10 seconds later, he smiled and said, pop up, I love you. I'm good now. And off he went to his grandmother's arms. As for my firstborn granddaughter, well, that's a whole nother story. As she sat on my lap and we looked into each other's eyes with my heart completely melted, she couldn't see the wide smile that was beaming under my mask and toward her beautiful eyes, but she could see my tear-soaked face. I basked in the love and the light of this beautiful October morning with the most beautiful girl in the world. In total contentment, we sat together in the warm October sun, the two of us. She held my fingers. I cradled her in my arms. We were in love. It was better than I ever imagined. Christmas had come in October. All across Ohio, America, and the world, Christmas has been arriving on different days over the past 11 months. I've actually seen it in my neighborhood sometimes as grandparents or parents pull up 
as children come into the house for the first time or meet in the driveway with their loved ones. Yet I know that too many of us are still waiting for Christmas to come. To that point, I haven't held any of my adult children in over seven and a half months. I'm still waiting for Christmas to come with them. Here at First Church, many babies have been born who I haven't seen or held. Our children and grandchildren are growing up, and I yearn to see them and hug them and talk with them about their lives and how they're doing. For the past 32 Sundays, you have seen me and Mr. Mark and Emily, who gets today off a much-deserved break, and sometimes you get to see Kevin, but you always get to hear him. But we don't see you. Although some of us have spent almost 21 years together in the presence of one another, most of us have now spent 224 days apart. Yes, I count those days too. How long has it been since I've seen you? How long will it be till we see each other again, till we hug each other again, till we hear each other's voices again and are in one another's presence? I truly miss the newborns, the infants, the toddlers, the young children, the teens. I was on FaceTime the other night with one of our families, and I came with my face on up close in the FaceTime, and the three-year-old on the other end ran out of the room. So I know that there's not everyone waiting to see this face that close. But I do also know that you're growing up fast, that the kids are growing up, and we miss this amazing time of watching you grow. God didn't create me to be a virtual shepherd. I was designed by God to be by your side, not on your screen. God didn't create you to be a virtual person in the things that you do either. But if we can keep together while we're apart with this screen time, we can come together and for the sake of living and life and hope and all that we hold dear, we will be together again. All of us are feeling exhaustion and impatience as we let our guards down. And in so doing, we're seeing that we're opening ourselves up as a nation to a whole new wave of COVID-19. I'm tired of wearing a mask, everybody says. And now over 8 million Americans have tested positive for COVID-19. Over 70,000 new cases just Friday. And more than 219,000 are now dead. The cases are rising as exhaustion and impatience increases as well. And as we move indoors, we have to let endurance and perseverance win over exhaustion and impatience. Through it all, there is something I know about our children. They are teaching us how to thrive in the midst of a survival mentality and reality. Last week, Jamie Blair, when she was here, said something very interesting. Jamie teaches voice and music in the public schools, and she said last week something that stuck in my mind. She said, the children get this. They're showing us how to get through this. It's the adults who don't seem like they're able to get it together. To which I say, amen. In what appears to be a role reversal, the children are leading us, as scripture teaches us, and they're showing us how to mask, how to wash hands, how to socially distance. Why is it the children are acting like adults, and adults are acting like two-year-old toddlers on their worst terrible two day. But day in and day out, we adults could thrive and not just survive if we took our cues of thriving from our children. I believe our children show us a better way through their honesty, their sincerity, and their trust. Honesty, sincerity, and trust are all qualities demonstrated in the interaction 
between God and Moses today in Exodus 33 and read so beautifully by the Washington family. Moses is once again in the presence of Almighty God, who is once again and understandably ready to sever relationship with the people called God's chosen people. Moses intervenes once again. He cries out to God, show me your way. He calls upon God to come clean with me. He asks God to explain what God is all about. How loyal is God? How forthright is God? God needs to show the people the way out of the desert and into the promised land. Not only that, they won't go unless God comes forward with them so they move together. God is called on by Moses to show me your glory, he says. First show me your way, then show me your glory, he says. Moses is a tireless mediator who remains loyal to his people even when they are disloyal and disrespectful and unkind to him. That's what leadership looks like in hard times. He remains loyal when they're disloyal. They wander away from Moses. They move away from God. But Moses stays steadfast to them and demands that God do the same. He gets in God's face, if you will, and says, we need you to show us the way. He demonstrates tremendous courage to confront God. I don't know about you, but that's not easy to do. His courage grows out of the relationship he has with God. He is honest with God, and God responds. Finally, Moses gains God's commitment to move through the madness of the wilderness life and head with them to the promised land, not abandoning them, but moving forward together. God makes three promises to Moses in the process of moving forward. First, God says, I will give you rest. Second, God says, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, which is kind of God's way of saying, you know, if you're gracious, I'll be gracious. And then God says, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. So this moving forward part for God includes rest and grace and mercy but it also has a demand attached to it that if I am moving forward in this spirit, you need to move forward in this spirit too. If any people in any time are ever going to make it out of hard times, they frankly, they need rest, they need grace, they need mercy from God, and they need God to lead them to the other side. And along with rest and grace and mercy that we all need right now, in the end, it is God's compassion that prevails. So rest, grace, mercy, and compassion in pandemic times are all keys to thriving. If we are constantly tired and lack grace and mercy and compassion, we will not make it through these hard times, and we will leave many others behind us. When our children tell their children about this time, what will they say? Will they say that their parents finally followed them and together rose up with them and did the right thing with them on behalf of all of God's children? Or will they say that we failed while they tried to make it on their own? When the history of the world is written about this pandemic, I pray that historians and our children and our children's children will be able to tell about all that we did as sisters and brothers in need to let compassion prevail. When I consider our children and compassion needed in these times, the one person I always am pulled to and drawn to is Dr. Marion Wright Edelman. Through the years, Dr. Edelman has served the nation's children through the founding and directing of the Children's Defense Fund. In my estimation, no one has fought harder and longer for children's rights and protection than Dr. Edelman. In her beautiful book, Lanterns, A Memoir of Mentors, 
She shares many stories of the women and men who mentored her to become who she was. Some of them were iconic champions of social justice through the years, people she read about but didn't know. And some were teachers, some were friends, some were family members, and some were fellow sojourners on this planet. And you know what? A whole bunch of them were children. In one chapter, our children as mentors, she lifts up the lessons that she learned from children through the years. She writes, children have taught me to confront unvarnished truth and unpleasant facts that I've often wanted to avoid. Children have taught me forgiveness. Children have taught me resiliency. Children teach us that love is what matters most. Children teach us to be courageous and to stand up against injustice. In each case, she tells transformational stories of how specific children in her life changed her life. Although it is true and powerful that children mentor us, Dr. Edelman calls us as parents and educators, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, to make a pledge to all the children. Here it is, and I encourage you to take this pledge up with me today, as I do, as I step into it myself. I pledge to listen to my children. I pledge to communicate with my children. I pledge to teach my children right from wrong and to be a good role model for them. I pledge to spend time with them and pay attention to them. I pledge to educate my children in mind, body, and soul. I pledge to work to provide a stable family life for my children. I pledge to vote for my children to ensure them fair treatment and opportunity. And I pledge to speak out and stand up for my children's needs and support effective groups that help children. So I make this pledge today, I hope you do too. Whether you have children or not, whether they are small or full grown, I pray that you can pledge to support the children, to sustain them in these times. There are so many lessons to learn and share today. There are so many ways that we can stay tuned in to the voice of God speaking to us through our children. Today I pray that, like Moses, we take our case and cause to God. And I pray that out of our relationship with God, we listen to how God shows us the way and shows us the glory that can come from following. I pray that like the Apostle Paul, we learn to acknowledge and celebrate the men and women who deliver us to this day and through this day, and that we praise God and glorify God for their presence in our lives. And I pray that like Jesus, we may call that the children come unto us and to see and to say that unless we become like children, we will never enter the kingdom of God. I also pray that Christmas comes for you during this pandemic. Don't wait for December 25th. Open your eyes and receive the gifts of God's love that are coming to you now. The gifts are everywhere waiting to be found and opened, received, and celebrated. Thanks be to God for the Christmas gift that we call our children. Amen.